very unusual happenings in my life. That, that I found myself um, having deliverance from demons and it absolutely changed my life. I felt it inside me and it's very strange after all that life, a 24 year old, hided up in a Stanic coven and they said, right, it's your time. If you give us the soul of your firstborn child, you will have a kingdom. Brian, how are you, brother? I'm absolutely fantastic. How are you today? <laughs> I'm firing, mate. It's my only mode. Good. Even when I'm not firing, I'm firing. <laughs> You've done enough firing in your life, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, paradise is a decision in your head, mate, isn't it? You know, and we, we all can make that switch. I, I, I guess from what you're going to tell me during this podcast that you two have been through similarly um, traumatic scenes in your life. Uh, I say similarly, I'm, I'm, I've got a feeling I'm about, I'm, I may be about to hear much worse. Um, and that was our, eventually a gateway to what I would call kind of waking up, embracing the universe, listening to, to I call it mother nature, mother nature's message, spirit, uh, some people call it God, what, what it, it's irrelevant, but I think there's never been a time in certainly my history where this uh, 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 hugely misunderstood area of life needs to be understood. Anyway, I, I'm conscious I don't want to talk, talk too much, but my point was, mate, that it's funny how trauma, isn't it, opens, the, eventually opens the gateway to enlightenment. Uh, it's like that. It's a bit like that, isn't it? It's like you, whatever you get put through until you, um, you know, until something different happens in your life, which certainly happened to me. I went through a very unusual, um, very unusual happenings in my life that, that I found myself um, having deliverance from demons. And it absolutely changed my life. I felt it inside me. And due to a very sinful life that I lived in the past that I'm not proud of at all. You know, I've been down many roads. Many of them were the absolutely wrong, wrong road. But now I stand today in the grace of God. You know, I know that, you know, we're, none, of us are, none of us are perfect. None of us. Um, you know, the, in the word of God, it says not one of us is righteous, not one. Everybody, um, everybody's found guilty under the, law of God and when we repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ um, we are found not guilty due to his blood and he's a propitiation offer for our sins and when we walk on in that journey should we decide to repent of those sins and walk through that journey it's not a journey it's an easy journey um, but it's a journey of failure upon failure repentance standing up looking to the cross it takes quite a while to understand what it's all about but during the last four or five years of my life, I've seen my own deliverance and freedom from a lot of things in this world. I've seen um, many people healed dramatically, um, physically through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've also seen them healed mentally. Soldiers, actually, who'd been in battle, who'd seen the most traumatic, traumatic things during the healing ministry, getting healed, having certain spirits in them and strongholds in their brain because of the trauma that they had um, they'd been through due to being Afga in Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, I mean, they didn't have to have that. The cross is there for our pain. The cross is there for our sin. The cross is there to put everything under a new beginning and a new life and to be born again in the spirit of Jesus Christ. So go for it, mate. Take us back to this, um, to the beginning. Well, I was born in 1969 in Edinburgh at Ashley Ainsley Hospital. Um, my mum and dad separated when I was three years old. 
and I went to live with my grandmother with my mum for a while. Um, I lived there and uh, my grandmother was very close to me. Um, and, you know, I was, I had problems at school due to probably the breakup of my parents and from a very young age, you know, a lot of um, bullying, a lot of fighting, a lot of not listening to teachers at school, felt a, bit, a little bit out of place. Um, a bit traumatic, I had a bit of trauma when I was young with my granny. It was being a bit, you know, it was hard to control at times. So my grand put me in my room, got me in my room. And I screamed out the, from the bedroom, I screamed, you're not my real gran. And she um, opened the door in tears and said, I'm not actually your real gran. And it was a shock to me. Complete and utter shock. I was like, you are my real gran. And it was like, you know, as a child, I was insecure enough, really, um, for hearing that. Um, so, mum, eight, eight years of age, my um, mother um, got a new man in her life. His name was Terry. He came one day and he was like, come on, we're moving. My mum says, come on, we're moving. We have a, a new house now. You have a new dad, a stepdad, etc." And we left my grands. I mean, it was a bit of a shock to me at the time. So I left my, left my grands and we went to live in another house that they had. And, you know, I got, he started to abuse me physically and beat me. You know, he was brought up in children's homes. And um, yeah, the beatings were, you know, when my mum was at work, he would beat me sometimes two or three times a day. And it was, it wasn't like your normal beatings. It was basically, it was, it was tough, you know, it was uh, knocking me senseless sort of things. But he got brought up in a children's home himself. And I'm quite sure, you know, by what's been going on in your channels and channels around it, what the children's um, children's homes can be a breathing ground for abuse himself, and you know, God bless him that now, and I totally forgive him that, that that what happened, you know. But to me, at that time, it was tough. It hardened me up. Um, I loved football. Played a lot of football as a kid. Just put my mind into sport and football. Um, and then he, he was there for say four or five years. And I, I actually hated him, actually. You know, there was one time my, my mother came in. I hated him at the time, but I do not do not hate him now. You know, I forgive him now. And um, my mum came in one day and she says, you know, she, I, I went into the hall. She had no real idea of what was going on. And um, I staggered into the hall, you know, um, basically completely sparkled. You know, I couldn't hardly stand up. I had like a vicious beating and that's when she really got to grip, see what was going on with this guy. He was a bit of a bit of an animal really. Um, so we moved to a new area. Um, I, start, I start to begin the martial arts very young at 12 year old. I started the martial arts because I was getting bullied. It didn't take me long to get really good at it. I sort of threw myself into it in a very big way and it so happened that my mum and stepfather broke up. And uh, when, they, when they broke up, it was like one of the best days for me. I remember taking the video recorder and saying, I'm sorry, son, but this is it. And inside my heart was sort of jumping for joy. And he says, you know, son, I'm going to tell you something. I've gave you no freedom. And it's probably the worst thing you're going to have is having the freedom when I go. In a way, he was sort of correct. So me and my mum were left in the house. Um, during that time, just at the beginning, before it, you know, my introduction to the house and the state was a bunch of skinheads going up the road, punching me in the mouth and hitting me. You know, that was to be a gang that I was to end up leading years, years later, um, unfortunately, you know. Um, so he left. Um, my granny brought me up, you know, things were going seemed all right, I'm getting into the martial arts. And basically my grand died and that broke me. You know, there was a lot of things going on at school. You know, there was a bully, he was bullying someone at school a lot. And there was knife crime, people getting knifed and hit with bricks, you know, in that age. And even at that very young age, 12, 13 year old, someone got stabbed in my area and killed by a knife. 
He was about 12 or 13. His name was Wee Mac and he lived in Edinburgh. God bless him. But, um, you know, I, I, my grand died. I looked to the, up to the sky and I says, God, I hate you. I says, I absolutely hate you. I says, I'm going to follow Satan. And I, and I did. And my whole, everything stepped up. I got more into the martial arts. Um, I took a sword. My, my martial arts instructor gave me a bow. And for being, with the, well, supposedly a very good student in the martial arts. And this guy went and hit my, hit my friend over the head with a brick behind. And I snapped and I went along there and I put the sword into his head, unfortunately. And uh, nearly killed him. Uh, that's unfortunate. So my life then was in the gangs. Uh, rival interstate gangs, petrol bombs, fighting. Most nights of the week, um, different areas in Edinburgh. Involved in the football, football hooliganism, things like that as well. Um, and that was my life, really. And my mother, um, we didn't know that the, the stepdad hadn't been paying the mortgage. And me and my mum had a letter saying, we have to be out, you're getting evicted from your house. So me and my mum got thrown out in the street when I was 14. And I had to go and live with my auntie and my uncle and... Um, they were all bikers and that, biker, they were in the biker gangs and things and, and a lot of heavy metal music and you used to say, feel my arms are like steel and a lot of bullying and things like that or trying to anyway and uh, that's the area I sort of grew up there for the next few years, getting in and out of trouble and things like that. Got done with another serious assault charge, charged. And then my mum got a, a new house, got on her feet when I was 15, 16, I moved in well. And then what happened, I was walking on, you know, that my whole life is, it was either stabbing car tires, I, I burnt my mother's school down, the old school, the, and I sat on a skylight at the school and I was dropping petrol bombs in and uh, the flames were coming up to my feet. It's, it's unbelievable. And I mean, fell in there, to be honest with you, but thank God I never. You know, so 15 year old, I'm walking up Lothian Road in Edinburgh and I pass the um, Royal Marines. Um, the Royal Navy, Royal Marines um, office to join. I had a look and I thought, you know what, this is this looks a bit for me and that. So I went in there at 15 year old, told them I had um, criminal convictions. He said, what are they for? I said, violence. He says, don't worry. He said, that's okay. Put me up in this pull-up bar where I was up there doing loads of pull-ups and certain things like that. And then he put me into what's called a PRC course. Potential recruits course. So I go down there at 16 year old, which is far too young, I think, really, you know. Um, I was physically really fit, but mentally, Jimmy, was far too young, I thought, to be there at the time. But, you know, the fitness, the fitness I thought, you know, got down there, done the PRC, the potential recruits course. You've done it, the 3D course. Where what, what year were you there, mate? I think it was 86, 87, 87, I think. 86, 87. Yeah, I was there 87. It was hard, wasn't it? It was, it, it was, but it was an experience that I would never, ever, and it was a great experience in my life. So I went in there and I sit down in front of the Wren and she says, why do you want to join the Marines? I says, to kill people. She says, see you later, bye, you're not getting in. So I failed the PRC. He says, try again in a few months later. So I tried again a few months later. I realised that it was my attitude. Went down there, passed the flying colours. You know, I was so fit at the time, Chris. You know, I could do, at 16-year-old, I could do 47 overhanded pull-ups on the bar. That's when, I, when I sat down with that Wren, she said, ah, potential recruit through. Yeah. You're the one that did 19 pull-ups in the gym. <laughs> Yeah, and that's amazing, isn't it? You know, the, that, that was amazing, uh, you know, and uh, so went down past it, all for it, was training like mad, doing a lot of running with bricks and that, a lot of training, press-ups, you know, I was really into it. So I went down there and I joined Troop 531. Brilliant. Joined it, flying colours, loving the first few months, 
And basically what happened was my great grandfather died. And they said to me, if you leave here, they said, you've just done your time, this amount of time now. If you leave here, you will be back trooped. And I was like, they'll never back trip me. I'm doing too well. <laughs> he says, well, worry if you go up there and do it. So I went up there, went back to Edinburgh for the funeral, thinking they're never going to do that. And uh, I got back and they back trooped me. And then, then I got pure hell. I was in, oh, they hated me. Um, you know, I had to do some exercises again. And the training team just hated me. They, they were all out, you know, because obviously during the first few months and that I was boxing, you know, you do the, the boxing, you do this and do that. And, you know, I was one of the fitter ones and I'd had a, a bit um history with fighting and things like that. So, you know, they took a dislike to me and they, you would come in in the morning and it wasn't the real, the, the, the whole ethos had changed for the training team of the first one because this training team were absolutely brutal. They would actually get people, get them down in the ground and boot them down, punch them in the face before they were going out. I didn't think really that that sort of approach makes the best soldiers. I don't know, you were in the robberies a long time, but you know, that kind of along the ground, booting them. And yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure you probably experienced or heard some of the horror stories that happened, you know? Yeah, well, so that, that era, Brian, was post Falklands, wasn't it? And there was a almost a, I don't know, I don't know how you describe it, but let, let's just say it's well known that that period was incredibly hard. Some troops were joining. We joined up with about 55 back then. Some yeah. troops were passing out with six original members. Yes, yes. I understand yeah. what you mean. But, you know, it was like very similar to what you're saying was what it was like. The training team I had before that was very hard, but very fair, but very encouraging. But when you, and you know what's happened when you get back, it's not a good thing in the Marines anyway, but... Um, you know, it was very similar to, to what you were saying uh, happened, you know. I was on the exercise and I hurt my ankle and it was twisted. My ankle was a bit twisted and that. And it was, oh, you've got a twisted ankle. He goes, can you carry on? And I was like, all right. She said, I've got a friend for you. And he tied a brick around my neck. And I had to run around with this brick. And when I was under the bivy at night, you know, I was determined to finish the exercise. I was like, I wasn't going in the truck. And he says, where's your brick? You're Where's your best friend, Knox? And I said, and he caught it out and said, it should be on your neck. And do you know how your bivy is really tight? He actually tried to drop the brick in my face. And I was under the bivy and he dropped it, but the bivy was so tight, it just stopped right at my nose crest, you know? So carrying on, got back. I was in there and I was cleaning. Every night I was going back, I was made to clean up the, the, the galley, you know, the dishes, which was difficult. He put me in there. And then I was cleaning the, the exercises, the thing where everybody done the toilet. So it was, it was a bit different. And I understand that I have total um, sympathy for anybody who's damaged. But um, back troop again, dislocated shoulder, NDX troop. And you know what it's like when you're in there, out you go. Some people cheated the cards at the door, didn't they? They were meant to be back at a certain time. Depends what what part of your training you were going through, any exit up, all the girls, all this and all that. I'm sneaking back in there at night, not even going through the gate. First time I'd done it and got in the camp in Lumsden. I was there, it's just after Prince, Prince Edward left. That's the time I was there, so whatever year that was. And I got in and then the second time I'd done it, I used to go into Lumsden and, you know, meet this girl that used to be having to do, going to graveyards, sexual stuff again and all that, and then I'm going back, I sneak in the camp one night, and basically, shh, shh, down, 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 down. Rifle at my head, uh, SLR, I think. They did the S80s, were just coming in then. He says, name, rank, and number, they said, down, down, and I was like, PO46786, Foxtrot, the cook knocks, he said, what are you doing? You could have been shot, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I go up to the troop, I'm recovering for whatever it was. And, you know, the beasting and the laughing, you know, with, with the older troop, I used to be on the um, on the exercise. The, the training team called me Frisk, but it meant 
effing repulsive, ignorant Scottish pig. And that's what they, they were told to call me that, which again is a bit nuts, really, thinking back. But um, there was two of them laughing. In the, in the morning when I got up, there was an inspection in Dieppe Troop. Um, I woke up, went to my bed, they took, and they took the springs at my bed I went through. And then I, I woke up in the morning for the inspection, went up there to get the bolt cutters because they bolt cutted my locker. When I came down and opened my locker, the two of them were laughing at me across from me. And then I just snapped and I smashed the two of them in with the bolt cutters after weeks and months of total dogs abuse. And I really damaged the two of them. And that was me then. Leave or you're leaving sort of thing. And so the best thing was I left. I left the Royal Marines, came out there and got involved in, unfortunately, organised crime. So the bullies won then, didn't they? What what I mean is 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 um bullying's unacceptable in any circumstances, let alone in the Royal Marines. That's what happened. I snapped and I just seen dark, you know. And I, but I think that's a sign of trauma, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, that was the story in my life. You know, I was bullied from my stepdad. I was I was abused mm. physically in a very big way, and uh, you know my whole life was fighting at school and in and, 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 and funnily enough, looking after the people who did get bullied. That's what I thought I was doing, you know. And um, you know, maybe even ended up one myself in the end. You know what it's like, you know. And, and then you get the Royal Marines who build you up in that way. You know, you're in inspection and they're coming up and saying, "How does it feel to be a superior being?" And you believe it, you know, and if you get that sort of pumped in your head for a number of months, no matter if you're there for the training and you you didn't pass to pass out or whether you do, which is probably worse, you know, you believe you're a superior being to any human being. And you, you have this pride and arrogance where you sort of would look down and you'd look silly or whatever. You know, I met a few, a couple of the people that, that, that in the later years, I met a guy called Steve. He was in my troop and he went on to be in 4-5 commando and another guy who I met in prison years later. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, definitely. Um, what what were these guys saying when you met them years later? Well, years later, my mate, he was in Camacho group. I met him in, the, um, in jail, actually, in Monsworth years later and uh, he'd been in the corps for a number of years and someone done something to him in a pub and he went over to them and he just grabbed their throat in a certain way that I'd never seen. You know, at any time. I've seen it maybe in jiu-jitsu or something like that. And he went and grabbed it. And it done some his nervous system. His legs and feet just started ticking. And I was like, wow. I thought, that is so dangerous, man. You know, and that's what you get taught. You're getting taught to kill people. You're, you're, get, you're, get, you're getting trained to be a killer and have that installed in you. Where, you know, and you're swearing allegiance to Her Majesty. You know, you're, you're swearing in there and... Uh, you know, the, the Bible says you're not swearing off on anything, doesn't it, really? So you are going to be changed and, uh, you know, it's into a, a trained killer, aren't you, as, as, as you know what happens in, in the forces and, and more so the Royal Marines, SAS, Parachute Regiment. The guy that talks a lot of, or used to talk a lot about this was Ben Griffin. Yeah. And, um, oh, there we go, we're back. Yeah, Ben Griffin just talks about the psychology behind the military machine and yeah. and all, all the things you've mentioned. Absolutely. I mean, my um, my uncle was 27 years in the Royal High and Fusiliers. He's got a red birthmark down one side of his face. Very, very tough man. Um, my grandfather was a regimental sergeant major and both then promoted to a captain of the Royal High and Fusiliers. And he died in Belize, Belize of um, malaria, actually. So I should have joined the family regiment. But do you know what? Because my mum and dad split up and I was like this and like this, I thought, Marines. And uh, they probably wouldn't have liked it, really. Um, but I should have joined the family regiment. And you know, talking about the Royal Marines back then, how tough it was. You know, they said that 300,000 people applied every year. And out that three, I think it was like three hundred thousand, 
I think 1,200 got accepted for the course. And out to the commando course, I think it was a mark or something like two or 300 past the year. So that was the statistics for that then. I would, I would say to you that, you know, this is, this is my opinion, which we're all entitled to, but the two people who really know what's going on in this world right now is a radical believer in Jesus Christ, who has the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Satanists, who are actually in charge of the Freemasons. And if you, that, that documentary that you were speaking about the other day, um, that is a real wake up to a lot of people out there. They should watch that. If you want to know what's going on in the world, that guy was chosen for sure. And the, the evidence is there backed up on paper, everything in that. And that is where we're headed. And people are, you know, we're not going to stop what's coming. This hasn't even began yet. Mm. In, the, in the word of God, they say the seven year tribulation. I believe we're just going into it right now. And we're going to need a lot of faith. And it's not our faith. It's Christ's faith that's going to get us through this time. Tough times are coming. Tough times. I'm telling you, you, you have a look outside. Lot since last year, since the polls went up, this came in. Something radical is changing. People are living in a lot of fear. And I tell you what, it's nothing to do with religion. It's about the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way you really get is by reading the word of God. So, Brian, you asked to leave, or you, I'm not, I can't even remember. Service is no longer required, I think we called it, from, from the Marines. That's correct. Uh, what, what effect did that have on you? Well, it, it, threw, it threw me out into the world with a worse attitude than I ever had, really, you know, because it drummed a superior authority and a pride into me, even that short time I was there. You know, and I got out of there, and when I, I left there, I, I ended up um, back in Edinburgh, and I got involved in organised crime, selling drugs. How does someone get involved in in that? Well, um... well it was friends that my mother used to know from my youth, um, that used to be quite in organised crime and things like that, mm. and. Um, employed me to pick up to do debt collection for money and also um, drug couriering between Edinburgh and London, which I'd done for a number of months. And I used to go down to London. I used to love the high life. Met people like Nigel Benn, who was just about to challenge for the world title. We had manager, Ambrose Mendy, his name was. Um, used to go down to a jewellers in Ilford and get um, kilos of hashish and um, cocaine to take back up to Edinburgh. Used to go into the Hippodrome and show off, you know, with the money at a very young age. Getting on the train, came back from Edinburgh. Sometimes I would throw the drugs out the window. Sometimes I would get off at a certain station and get a pickup. And um, one time, a few months into it, um, I got caught. I got off the train one day. Um, something happened. The, the, the guy who was organising it all, someone failed to turn up somewhere. So he had to do it himself. He was getting followed by the drug squad. I went up into his van, jumped in the van, went a mile and a half, two miles down the road at the Royal Circus in Edinburgh. And um, all we knew is he said we're getting followed. Two cars came up behind, two overtook. The Sweeney ju jammed the car in, drug squad. Uh, we actually thought it was a hit on us. And then um, drug squad jumped out the car. The, 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 they jumped out their car. The baseball bats came out, the window came in, arrested, done. Cocaine on me only that time. Did you know any of the, the, the Essex boys then? No. Because they were they were Nigel Ben's bouncers at one point from from videos I've seen on YouTube. Possibly could possibly could have been all that sort of circle was involved with the same sort of network really. So off to prison I went. You know, that was my first offence. I was told if I would have stuck stuck the guy in who I got it off, that I would have walked. But I was not doing that. You know, I was. Mm. 
too proud and it was the time for me to do my time in the jail. And um, he says, if you put his name in, with the two years got charged. It was me, a guy from Edinburgh, and um, they said, if you put him in, you will get off and walk. I said, no way, I'm not doing that. And the, 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 the barrister was so, my barrister was so annoyed that I wouldn't do it. I sacked him. And then I was at the mercy of the judge who gave me three and a half years in prison. First offence. First adult offence. Were you sniffing a lot yourself, Brian? Not really. No, I wasn't at that time. I was fit. I'd done a little bit, but not so much, really. It was a good time. It was a good thing I got to prison because during the eight months prior to me being at the Royal Marines, I was getting in a lot of fights. I loved violence. I was very cold and seeing myself um, well, not just enjoying what I was doing. I was loving what I was doing. You know, I thought this is the path I'm on, you know, and getting this name for myself around the city and things like that. Um, basically getting known for violence and, you know, just doing some crazy things like three people in a pub and asking them all outside for a fight at the same time. I would sometimes put my head on the ground and say, come and kick me then. And, you know, I don't know how they never done it or whatever. I used to get up. And I used to attack three people and win, win the fight. And, you know, I was really just quite a seriously hurt individual. I was extremely, extremely damaged. And this is what I actually inside, if I wanted to be very sincere with you, I actually wanted to die probably in a lot of ways. I was quite dead inside, you know. Yeah, well, when you look at some of the stunts we get up to over the years, it does look like we've got a death wish, doesn't it? Well, I certainly had one of them most of my life, that's for sure. Mm. Was that was alcohol a big feature then? It, it, it... No, I was fit. Yeah. I was very fit. I did get drunk, but I, I was always in the gym. It was at a stage in my life where I was extremely fit. I knew I had to be fit to do what I was doing. You know, yeah. I had to be that level above, you know, about other people, strength and fitness-wise. So I went into prison and... Um, I looked in there and I thought, do you know what? I thought, this is good. I thought, this doesn't bother me. Um, I was like, if I, if I can be in the Royal Marines and this is, it was a lot harder than in here and compared to being in there, it was like, I'm not meaning to sound rude, but a lot of the people in jail were like, what, at the time, what I would have called Muppets, really. You know, and um, while I was in prison, I was involved in a lot of prison fights. Can you give us an idea of some? Just because I know people at home listening won't, many of them, many of them won't have been in a prison fight, Brian, and they, they might be quite interested to know how do how do these things manifest? Well, prison is a little like a jungle in itself, you know, and uh, you you know you have to be the strongest to survive, and um, people want to make a name for themselves, and I would find. You know, I knew a lot of the the, 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 the Hibs football soccer um, hooligans and that who were quite vicious, you know, um, at the time. And um, just anybody would be in the prison. For example, one time I was in bed and someone was pouring pee out the window and I was in the cell below them. And I could feel it started to come in and hit me in the face. So I would go up the, the, the stairs and I went in his cell as soon as it got opened up and uh, I, done, I was quite viciously attacked him for that. You know, that's just one instance of many others. Jail riots, you know, I've been in jail riots where, you know, maybe a paedophile came in the hall and um, the, the whole hall would attack him. Suddenly they'd find out who he was. There'd be maybe 150 guys in this hall and you suddenly get every metal, metal, um, every metal tray getting flung at him, attacked. The prison officers would have to come in and extract him from the area. Then the whole hall would sit in and say, we're not going anywhere. We're sitting in. We're controlling the environment. Then they would come in with the big shields and everything. And we knew as prisoners how far to push that in some ways. And then we would be escorted back to the cell. You know, I see myself getting put in solitary confinement sometimes 
for behaviour um, issues. Um, normally fighting, you know, we, you know, it could be anything random where even you're having a shave in the morning and someone would look at you the wrong way. And you knew that if you gave him an inch on you, everybody would know that that was your area. So, you know, I would some bust one in the jaw, break his jaw perhaps, or uh, someone like that getting in a fight. So many. Um, again, I'm not proud of it now. You know, my heart's changed now um, for who I used to be, you know. And so I got the three and a half years, got moved from Sopton Prison, which was a prison in Edinburgh, got moved to, um, it was called Pomont, which was a young offenders institution that was full of children from different areas, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dumfries, Dundee. And you would find that the Glaswegians would stick together, the Edinburgh would stick together, and there would be a bit of rivalry. A lot of people in warfare, um, Glasgow people and Edinburgh people fighting um, in the prison due to the area they came from. I got put in prison and I was aware that there was a few Edinburgh guys that were on protection. And I sort of said to them, get out for you, we're not doing that, you know. And I had a few fights in prison with a few people from Glasgow. Um, found myself around the back of the back of the prison at one time, where someone offered me a fight, and I was like, "No problem, let's go." Because I used my hands a lot in the days because I was a good fighter, you know. I used my hands, and I went, "Right, let's go." Square go around the back. Went around the back of the prison. I've got my hands. He's pulled out a dumbbell bar of me. Tried to hit me. I got the dumbbell bar off him. And then we had a fight, a long fight for 15, 20 minutes, where I knocked him down. His face was a complete mess. Um, my hands were a mess. You know, I had a few marks on my face. But it was a real fight, you know, 15-minute fight is a, is a long fight. You, you'll know that yourself. And uh, the prison officers thought that I'd used the bar on his face. So they thought I used the bar on him, which I never did. He used the bar on me. Uh, that was one instance of yeah, a fight that happened. So I got put in solitary confinement for a while. Then there was another time where now the Edinburgh guys are having war with the Glasgow guys in prison. And it's now getting heated up, you know, it's getting intense rivalry and things going on. And um, someone again in the dining hall, some incident happened. I've said to him, you know, what are you doing? I've asked him for a fight. He's wanted to fight me. Immature baby stuff, really. I went into the to the, the male laundry room and then I fought with this guy. I've ended up on top of him. You know, he's wanted to fight me. He started it off. Um, I'm punching him in the face and beating him. I've got an iron in my hand and I put it over his face. And I was about to put the iron steam right in his face, the whole iron. Something in me said, stop it you're really going to get more time or whatever. I put it to the side and I said, you're a coward, you're an idiot. I got up, went back to my dormitory, well, no, my dormitory, to my cell in a block. And um, it was recreation time. And the door got opened up. I'll never forget the door got opened up. When I mean, the door got opened up, I was lying on my bed half asleep. He ran in and he slashed my face with a razor blade and a toothbrush. And it was real, it was quite bad at the time. So I put this thing on my face, I went to the mirror, the mirror and looked, and I, I burst into laughter. I don't know why, but I burst into laughter. And it, I don't know if it was the shock or whatever it was, but my two cousins were in the same prison. Remember, this is a young offenders institution. So, Dave came in and he says, I'm going to cut his eyes out. I know where he is. I'm taking this cut and I'm going to go over his eyes. He's went up to get him and then he's came back saying he wanted to apologise to me. You can understand, it's like children. Huh? He's came in there, he's got in the cell, I don't know how. I've managed to grab him, hit his head off the walls and whatever it is. He's managed to get at my door. I've run into the prison hall. 
the, 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 obviously the blood's going everywhere. I'm pounding this guy, I'll pass his head on the, on the railings and things like that. And then basically the prison officers came and split us up. And then that was it. I'm put into, I'm taken to the hospital, put into solitary. He's put into solitary, up to see the governor in the morning. The governor asked me who done it. It was quite seen who done it. I wouldn't say who done it. I never told them. Even though you could see who it was, I had to use my mouth to say that you're that he done that. And in prison, you can't do that, you know. So I said I never seen who done it. He got in there. He got sent to another prison. I tried to get sent to another prison, and then the prison of then the prison officer said to me, the prison governor said, you will spend every single day off your sentence in this prison. You're not leaving it. And I really wanted to leave it, you know. I wanted an exchange to a harder, even more serious prison, but he wouldn't be aware of that, really. So I served the rest of my time in there, in the mechanics also, which I didn't enjoy because I never enjoyed getting my hands covered in the oil. And there was a time also when I was in there when, like, this gang warfare was going on and, these people can be horrible, you know, bullies. And there was a guy called, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but he was from south, the south of Scotland, Dumfries. And he was continually getting harassed and bullied in a way, in a dimension that you would never believe. And he was at the breaking point. And I, he was sitting beside me in the mechanics. And what they did to him one day, he was a bit asleep. And they, when he was under a car, they put petrol on his trousers. And during break, he set light to his trousers managed to get out and he says, I'm snapping. He says, what do I do, Brian? And I turned around and says to him, I says, what do you do? I says, when he's next under that car, you go and get the biggest spanner you can. Pull him out and smash his head right in there. That's what you do. And then the shock was that he done it. He done it. He went over there. He pulled him out. He went there, or he waited on him coming from under the car. Seven, eight, nine, ten times in his head, and uh, that was him gone. More, 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 more prison time. More prison time, you know. So they knew what was going on. I was in prison, and I was getting drugs delivered into the prison. The prison officers knew it. They hated me. I never handled the drugs. I used to get them through the um, Tampax machines, and we, I used to do the drugs in the prison and do the drugs and get the drink in there and do all that sort of stuff, they knew it. They would come and turn over my prison cell most days. And they would say to me, the prison officer said to me that was in charge, he said, you, he said, you're going to end up doing a life sentence. I know it by what you're like. So that was it. I'd done my time and I got out of jail. And let me tell you something, getting out of prison is the best feeling in the world for any man. And I'm saying that I wouldn't um, advise anybody to go and get there and do it or do these things that I regret, regrettably done in my past. But um, the feeling when you do, when you are free and you've been in there is a phenomenal feeling. But, you know, what was it? It was an education on getting more violent, getting more cold, being around different people and actually young men who were, all on the wrong road, really, who never had any education in there or nothing about rehabilitation at all. Nothing at all. It's, you know, the, what use is prison? If it, Obviously, there's a punishment level to prison. But tell me, where is the rehabilitation? You know, and most prisoners come from a single parent background or an abused background. So they're damaged anyway, and then they're in there. Well, we don't we don't live under a a system of light, do we? We live under a system of of dark. I'm, I'm trying to avoid religious terms here, mate. But you yeah, know, we, it, it, the the powers that control us they're, they're not interested in kindness, love, empathy, understanding, um, because if everybody practiced that, they wouldn't be able to control us. So prison isn't for what it should be, which is rehabilitation, reform, education, love, um, giving these damaged young men 
that which society has stolen from them in in terms of abuse and violence and, and suffering. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm I'm not I'm not obviously not saying here, folks, you should just be able to go out and do what the hell you want to another individual, and there's no no recompense. I'm just saying that the way that it is at the minute, it's not about building a better society. It's about creating, uh, increasing the hatred and increasing division because um, people that control us, they just love that. They, they, they absolutely love it. I would absolutely agree with you. You know, um, I think a lot of people are in agreement, whether they're, they're in the new age or believers or whatever that, you know, they know about Satanism and they, knew, they know that Luciferianism and the demonic, um, is out there you know that's just part of life really I think everybody's aware of that it's in David Icke's books it's in different literature it's in the gospel as well well we, but, we, we need to be honest here and uh, let, we'll get straight back to your story but uh, uh, Satanism is the fastest growing religion in the world at this moment in 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 time yes um you know let, let, let let's just say it how it is if you you've only got to put something on like the Brit Awards and it's just in in your face they, they're the programming that they're personally i do wonder how much of it is just another control mechanism or another mechanism that the, the powers that be be used well, but, but yeah it, you, I, they're actually openly um at the oscars one of the actors says thank you thank you satan for this but that's the way it is you know we 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 we, we, move, we, we uh you know, as, as, as we'll see through time, this is all going to be more and more and more. That's all I'll say about that. We, you will see an increase in this. You will see an increase in the promotion of this in the future. So let me tell you, moving on, I get out of the prison and I'm hell bent to get into crime. I'm ready. I'm saying I'm taking this system right on now. So I get out there, I get out of the prison, I immediately start that very day. I got given bars of hash and I started going around and I started because I made the contacts in the prison. I knew now new people in different areas of Edinburgh. And because of my reputation or so-called reputation, I could give them drugs in different locations. Like, you know, like you would get, you would get an area, like you get an area like, Site Hill, Muir House, Edinburgh Central, you know, very similar to London, but on a very smaller scale. Do you get me? Yes. And the house and estates, you know, so you would find the dealer in there. You would go and supply that dealer. Very easiest business, obviously, you can do. As long as you can back up what you're going to do and people aren't going to try and take off you and things like this, which can be part of the, 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 drug, the, drug, the drug game. But, um, you know, that didn't happen to me. I obviously had a big firm behind me as well. We were a lot older. So basically I would go and drop the drugs off and I practically had most of the areas covered within a 12 month period of being out of prison. How much money was that bringing you in? In those days, could have been anything between about 1500 to four grand a week, I think. Mm. Is it fair to say at that age, you and the way your mind is set up at this moment, the the sort of consequences aren't really an issue. You you feel justified to that you feel justified, right? If, I didn't care at all about anything yeah. or anybody but myself at that time. Yeah, I lived a life of of, of um, womanizing, extreme womanizing. Probably there wasn't a time I'd ever had four or five girlfriends at the same time where I used to go and stay and move around. And that had become part of my lifestyle. Unfortunately, thinking back, you cannot change the past, but you can change the future. This was a lifestyle I got myself into. And I'll tell you something, as much and as quick as you make the money, you'll buy cars, you'll buy motorbikes, You'll buy expensive chains, Rolex watches, houses, the lifestyle that comes with a lifestyle, traveling, 
you start going in exotic holidays, you get used to it. It becomes the normal. You know, that's what it becomes the normal. Um, so I was it. I was into that, and um, then I got into uh, met four like-minded criminals and got into the rave promotion business, where I started a company called Maelstrom Promotions with me and three other criminals. We started that with them, and it was this the beginning of the raves in the eighties and nineties and the ecstasy and things like that, and we became very successful. We were the first promoters to get Enjoy in Edinburgh. The band Enjoy, K Class, The Prodigy. I would find myself up on the stage, shouting on the stage, um, shouting for Lucifer actually, and putting horns in my head and MCing with the, with the Prodigy band. Drugs involved, violence involved. And then what happened was there was a big rift in the company. Someone wanted a bit more than they did. Someone was the arranging for, they weren't happy with something. Then came a lot of gun crime. Then came attempted murders, a lot of violence. And I was right in the brunt of that. There was an attempt on my life to shoot me at my mother's door. Um, it was only by the grace of God I never, it never got me actually. Um, Brian, do it. I appreciate this is a sensitive area, uh, but do we know what Keith Flint's issues were when he killed himself? Um, or are we, are we, would we just be guessing perhaps? I don't, well, I, don't know. I, I will give you my opinion. He was, um, he had demonic possession and a spirit of suicide and he killed himself. Torment. He was tormented. You know, a lot of these people who get a lot of the, at one point they become idols and they start getting up there and they love it and they get so much adulation and people love them. So football players are very similar. You know, you look at poor Gaza, probably the best player that England ever produced. And they're used to 100,000 people and everybody's saying, you're so great, you're so brilliant, shouting your name, it stops. They've got a big hole to fill. Do you understand? What do they do? They hit the drugs, they hit this. The false friends are around them. The big money, it soon goes. The depression kicks in. They realise they've not really got any friends because they're hanger honours. And the depression sets in. And unfortunately, you get so many that kill themselves. Yes. And I'm wondering if it's, you know, if it's like the only way out, if you if you get what I'm saying. It's, it's, absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, I'm not going to mention that on this and I, anything that I've mentioned about what I believe in, you can leave it. To the, you can put my documentary up and they can judge it for themselves. The message is in there. Mm -hmm. I'll give them the story of my life. They've got a choice to make after that. Yes. It's... Yeah, the, what I'm, what I'm, in case people are wondering, what I'm saying is, is redemption comes to a lot of us, you know, forgiveness, forgiving yourself of your past, embracing the, the light and going forward with love, empathy, kindness, um, acceptance un, un, under this beautiful universe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's a wonderful way to be. It's almost like a, a get out of jail free card for some. Well, for, for some of us that have done, you know, things in the past we're not, we're not particularly proud of. Let, let's just say that. The point with the, the celebrities is, and of course, you know, there's a, a plethora of reasons why someone might take their own life. But I, I'm only wondering, Brian, if you've signed up to a pact where there is no way out. Yeah. You know, you signed up for the adulation, for the fans, for the you know, for the record deals, for this. Yeah. And then you suddenly find, ah, I, I got to, like, I got to stick at this stuff. They got no option. You know, it, it must it. Be, it, but you, you can't take that get out of jail free card. You can't seek that redemption. You're not allowed to. It goes against the, the contract. Yeah. Um, I just wondered if you had any, 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 any view on that because... 
Yeah, I've got a view on that. I get a view that the uh, that they they pledge allegiance to Lucifer. Yeah. Well, Firestarter. I mean, come on, you know, it's in the it's in the name. And you can see the, the, when he's the, doing the, the Devil Hunts, but we see it. Yeah. We see it with many bands and things like that, and a lot of people in the mainstream just when you think much of it, really. But you know, it means a lot more than they actually think, and it's. A lot of music is given um, mind control to a lot of people. You know, you, you you will agree with me that certain kinds of music makes you a different way. You'll get like um, Fleetwood Mac, you know, it put you in a, you know, like sort of a mystical feel to it. You know, like ACDC, they would have like a real aggressive feel to it. Really, music is a source of sorcery. And Lucifer, who they sign into, was actually... If you know a bit about it, a bit some stuff, was he was the worship leader of God, and that's why the music is everywhere and so good. Yeah, Lucifer's a fallen angel, right? Yeah, and this is why when you see movies like I think it's Paddington, and they're in a cathedral, and there's an angel statue, and it it just falls, and most people would have no idea of the. No idea at the, all. No idea of the symbolism, bit, uh, uh, what what this movie is, subli- the message, the this massive growing religion that we've talked about, they know what that symbolism means. Also during this time with the raves and slightly before it, I'd started because I was making a lot of money and I had a lot of pressure on me, I would find myself going to trips to Jamaica, extensive trips, four, five, six weeks, and I went to a place called The Grill. And I was starting to bring back bits of cocaine, nothing major, but um, I had people that I would go over there with and they'd bring this stuff back and uh, the fingers of surgical gloves, swallow it, bring it back. And I would sell it in Edinburgh. Never done it too many times, uh, but done it, you know, was another thing I'd done. And I used to love the risk taking. I used to be a thrill seeker then. And it, that, was, that was a behaviour pattern that was to go on through the majority of my life. So this rave thing kicks off attempts on my life, contracts on my life. Obviously it comes with a bit of paranoia, yeah? As you could imagine, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Attempt on my life, as I said, someone tried to shoot me. And another time uh, what happened was there was a contract on me and I was in a nightclub and there was seven or eight people in the nightclub I got told somebody wanted to see me at the door. I went to the door. The doors got locked on me. I ran up the road. I mean, I ran up the road. I had a knife on me. Not that I was a bad stabber or that. I mean, I'd used a knife. When people were going to use a knife on me, I'd find me doing that in the past. I'd used a knife on people. And I unfortunately damaged them a lot because they were going to damage me with a knife. So I turned around and it went right in someone's heart. And they survived. They survived the knife piercing the wall of their heart. And um, I, you know, I was so, you call it lucky or blessed or something. Eight or nine of them jumped on me, the baseball bats. I just curled up. The knife was in the guy's heart. My intention was to stab them all. I'm getting beaten up. What comes around the corner? A police car. And that was unbelievably just, what was the chances? Yeah, that happening. So the police car comes around the corner. I end up in jail. They end up in jail. And then I'm in there and they put me right into solitary confinement in prison. And I'm next door to the Lockerbie bomber. Haven't I came far? I'm next door to the guy that supposedly bombed Pan Am Flight 103. Then I start messing around. I was in there for three months. And that was probably one of the lowest times in my life really that was when I was most lost and I didn't want to bring in the religious thing and all that I didn't want to do it but this ex-girlfriend wrote to me and said Jesus and I thought do you know what piss off she kept writing to me I mean piss off then one day you know I was messing around with the prison officers and I would do something at the door like I had a bit hash so even though I was in solitary I got a bit hashies the guy, the guy who tried to shoot me at my door, some other people stabbed him in the prison eight times. It's a horrible life, really. Horrible. 
he got stabbed in prison by someone that I knew. Again, horrible, no proud of it, sick really. That's why I sort of, I skipped a lot of this stuff. But you want me to go in it, I'll go in it with you. But for me, it's not the easiest, but I'll do it. And I'm not proud of it at all. I want you to realise that I am not proud of my past and what I've done. It's important you get that. Because you know what, in that prison cell, I wasn't getting out. I tried to stab a policeman in the arm that got busted in my house with a knife. I was up for four kilos of hash and attempted murder. I wasn't getting out. Do you know what, at the end of that, I had some hashish and I was blowing it through the door in solitary to annoy the prison officers. They came in, they busted me again in solitary. I was a lost cause by this time. I was, I was, I didn't care if you killed me or whether I lived or whatever. I couldn't care less at that time in my life, which was very sad. They came in, they moved me to an and I'm giving them verbal. Then the prison officers come into the cell, eight-handed, six-handed perhaps, kind of give you the exact number. They come in with the big riot shields on and the, the PO comes round to the front. He says, come on then, hard man. Come on, take us then. And I looked and I thought, and I was a microsecond for diving in there. And I thought, you know what? As mad as I am, I'm not that mad. It kicked in the intelligence, you know. We've got to be a bit intelligent in life at times. And that would have been a situation that I would have just got it. Do you get me? So you could have been an animal or whatever. As I was, I was like practically an animal at the time anyway. But you know what? I wasn't in that much nuts to have bailed in there. So this girl wrote to me and I said, you know what, do you want, you know? Then I ended up doing this prayer, as you say, going into the light. And I prayed to this guy, Jesus, and believe it or not, that very day, the prison door opened. I got bail and I walked out of prison. And I could not believe it. I had been knocked back for bail, twice high court bail. You do not do it. You do not get it on the third time. I walked out and I thought, this is a complete miracle, man. And that was it. I got in prison. How, how did you get involved in this coven then, Brian? What, what, what's the story there? Because you saw... Well, that's, that's, become... that's slightly before I was in prison. Before I went into the prison, when all this was going on, this fiasco, with attempts on my life, I had a friend from Edinburgh. It's in my documentary anyway. And um, it's all explained in there. And then she took me to this, he took me to the house of his mother, who told me that she would be able to get things sorted out. How, how did you get, I, get this friend? Sorry, I'm just trying to paint. He, he, was a, he was a partner in crime. Okay. And his mother run the brothels in Edinburgh. And she used to do blown fire, like, you know, the petrol in her mouth. She used to do that. She was a, shall we say, she was a very dark lady. And if anybody wants to have a look at my documentary, they'll actually see comments from people who knew me in the past. And there's one for a guy called Jinxie, who actually says, yeah, I knew the woman and I knew Ando. I was his best friend at his wedding. So there's a confirmation there of what went on. And, you know, when I went into that coven, we are... Obviously, they're doing a lot of evil stuff. You know, I, I have a, I have a knowledge of sort of what goes on in there, but um, you know, it was I was there to give my soul to Lucifer. I mean, you think about it. At Thirteen year old, I prayed out that I would follow Satan and meet God. So it was very strange. After all that life, a twenty four year old, I ended up in a satanic coven, and they said, "Right, it's your time. If you give us the soul of your." firstborn child you will have a kingdom on this in Edinburgh in Scotland and by a kingdom it was obviously an organized crime thing and you know it took me aback I was very shocked about it you know I was sort of like I never done it I left and I, that was the bit that was the biggest decision I made in my life when they say the soul of your unborn child that what are they talking like? You meet a partner and you and she gets pregnant, pre or, or, or 
No, they 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 they, they do do that. The Luciferians do do that. They do have children and give it in to for its life and its soul and all that. But um, no, this was I never even had a child at the time, so I found it very odd, you know, that that that, that what she was asking for. But something in it, in, in just being there, you know, with the thirteen chairs around that table, the pentagram on the floor, there was a feeling of evil in there that I had never felt before, really. There was a real darkness, like an emptiness in that woman in her eyes, for one. I mean, by God, I'll, I'll tell you, I was pretty bad myself. But I'll tell you, compared to looking in that woman and the feeling that place was terrible. And I'll tell you, her husband had a, he was a Satanist as well. And he had a very high up position, you know, with a company called Caterpillar. Yes, very much. They, they do the trucks and that. He was mm. very high up in that. So thank God that I never that I never said yeah, you know. Who that would have changed the whole direction in my life, I believe. Didn't they um so I'm just gonna have a look here now. Then they got a pyramid in their logo, or am I um Dun, dun, dun. Sorry, keep talking, mate. Well, I've, I've... so yeah, <laughs> Ca caterpillar. What, what what a surprise! Well, it's it when you when you understand and your your eyes are open, you'll actually realise it's actually everywhere. You know, it's, it does say in the Bible that Satan is the god of this world. I think it means what it says, but again, that's for people to look for themselves should they want to go down that route. So I basically got out of prison. I ended up going into, um, when I got into prison, out of prison, I went to church. So, you know, one minute I was this crazy madman walking up the road with meat cleavers in my pocket or whatever, you know, meat cleavers on two sides, no hair, one of the crazy hats on or whatever, to being a, in a church. And it was a massive, like, shock, you know, and still paranoid and, 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 and like went in there and changing for that person to that person I didn't really have a clue what it was and it didn't take me long to fall away from it hardly took me any time to fall away from it actually because I didn't really you know my mind was my mind and my heart was it was 25 years of complete and utter poison in there and, and damage childhood damage violence crime drugs you know, uh, a lot of unforgiveness in me, in my heart and my soul towards my father and everybody who ever really hurt me in my life. I was cold and I was dark. So I fell away and it was then I found out that um, one of the girls I was saying by the name of Amanda, I married her years later. She got pregnant to me, but I was engaged to another girl who was a Christian. So I'd done the right thing in, in what I thought was my eyes and I left Janet and I moved in with who I was going to marry. It was Amanda, who was one of the few women at that time, because that's the life I lived in, unfortunately. I had the morals of an alley cat. And they wanted to leave me till very late in life, until I found out the truth. So I'm in there and I've got this um, situation. I moved in with Amanda, I get back into the security, back into the drugs. I start sending people to... Jamaica, the gods out the window completely. I'm like, get on with it, you know. Um, started going to Jamaica a bit more and that. I was going to Jamaica, I made friends with Yardies, spent a bit of time over there. Um, what a crazy experiences in Jamaica, uh, bringing cocaine and the surgical glove fingers across landing. Does that mean selling it? I'm taking you mean swallowing? They were swallowing, yeah. They were. Uh, did that, you have any like um, deaths from doing that? Someone very, very, very close to me, I'm not going to mention their name, nearly died. Yeah, so for friends at home, we're talking about putting um, the white stuff in, into balloons, balloons made of, in this case, surgical gloves. Terrible. Thinking back. 
it's done. I can only look forward now, and that's what I'm doing. But, um, you know, that person was very close to me. They were in bed, and I was nursing over them. And that poison had to come out of their, their bodies. And I actually got in touch with the Yardies, and I said, Do you know something? If he died, I would have killed you. I'm coming to get you. And I would have as well. And the thing was, the, the time during this time, the time before that when I was over there, it was a very great blessing that I couldn't go back to Jamaica. I could only send other people because I actually took like, it was £5,000 or £10,000 of fake £50 notes. And I got someone else on the island to cash them in, the pink, dodgy ones years ago. So they're cashing them in. I get on the cocaine, smoking it. So am I not drinking and on this cocaine in this room for two or three days? I forget, I've got one dodgy 50 left. I've smothered the island in the fake notes. What do I do? What do I do? I've got to pay my bar bill. What do I do? I'm so at my head. I go and I pay the barber with that £50. And I think, what have I done? What have I done? And I'll tell you, I went from the grill to Kingston Airport sweating and sweating that I was the net. But on that plane, I'll tell you something, that plane took off. That was one of the best feelings in my life as well. Because I would not have fancied time in a Jamaican prison and, you know, I used to hang out a lot with these people over there. And they were wild. And they stamped something on my personality as well. They really did. That ragamuffin, Jamaican, the way you treat women, you know, and all this, it really stamped into my personality in life. And I, I, I fell right into it because I liked it. And, you know, I was going over there and I lived that lifestyle. And uh, I seen a lot of unusual things in Jamaica. I seen one guy getting thrown off a cliff into the sea by the Yardies, who was a heroin addict, who asked him the wrong thing. I was aware of someone who was a Jamaican Yardie, Robert Goldtooth, um, his name was, and uh, they, they wouldn't let the Jamaicans in the pub, it was called the Pickle Parrot. And he blew his head off with a double barrel shotgun, one of the guys, it was wild, it was, it was like wild, you could see the, um, it was like the histories steeped in piracy. It's a hard, crazy, crazy place. And how I tell you, I got out there and how I started to deal with them in that, that was a story on its own as well. Because I should have been killed. When I first started dealing with them, I was in a nightclub with three or four guys from Edinburgh. And I was, there was a yardie dancing with a white woman and I started dancing, and um, the yardies, this guy said, he goes, I kill white guys, get out of the way or something. And I was snapping. I'd been, this was one of the first times I'd been to Jamaica. And I was snapping. I went, I kill anybody. Death off. When I'd done that, the whole place went quiet. Then somebody said, someone wants to talk to you at the door. My friends bottled it. They were like, what's going to happen to you? I was a bit, I was a bit local at, the, at that age, you know, and my mind wasn't really bothered in ways. And I went to the door, and the guy said, "Respect." He said, "I've never seen a white man do that in Jamaica," and that's how I met the yardie called Roberts. And I started dealing the coke. That was the first time I met him. He says, "You come to my house for dinner tomorrow." He says, "I like you, man." So I came, and we got this bond and friendship. That's how that all started off. Who, who are the Yardies then, mate? Uh, Jamaican, Jamaican gangsters from Kingston. In what, in what sense? As in like a cult? As in, as in like, a, like we might think of a motorbike gang? As in like, like mafia or mm. Soho mafia? Mafia, mafia, this... but mafia, but very rough around the edges. Very raw, you know, very um, vicious. And murder, drugs, no thought, no, no thought about anything, you know. Um, you just have to look at the history in the, of Jamaica, Kingston, and what goes on in the streets with the Yardie gangs, you know. It's crazy, man. It's nuts. 
shootings and, and stabbings and life is very cheap there, my friend. And what and that. what's the sort of affiliation then? Do they have rituals? Do they do they have an initiation? <sighs> their, their ritual is going at the bottom level, like all gang warfare, go in at the bottom level, prove yourself as a soldier right to the top. Prove yourself that you're willing to do anything. Prove yourself that you're willing to go over there and put a hatchet in someone, stab them, shoot them, stick the head on them, bring drugs from A to B, just do what you're told and do it and enjoy it. And then into rivalry, move up the ranks between each other, sometimes ends up in death feuds or whatever it is itself. That's the mafia, really, in a nutshell. Yeah, I met two guys um, in South America. I was on the piss with them one night. Freaking hilarious, these boys were. They were Canadian. They were oil riggers, right? So real, like, sort of, I don't know what you call it, but not rednecks, but because <laughs> they're Canadian. But you, you, you get what I mean. And um, they were telling me that they'd rocked up in Jamaica. They, they bummed a lift on a yacht. Yeah, because they bombed a lift on a yacht, they didn't have a return air, airline ticket. So yeah. there, there they were, camped out one day, and I um, oh know when it when they when they arrived there, they said someone came down to the dock and went, "Hey guys, come with me. I'll take you to immigration." <laughs> Excuse the bad impression there, folks, but and they went okay, and the guy took them straight to the cop shop knowing that because they come in on a yacht that they wouldn't have this thing, right? They were promptly arrested and put in a jail underneath the prison. And they said it was like a cave. with Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's like you get 15, 20 people stand up, cold floor. Cool. Yeah. How would you like to be a white guy in there? And I'm very blessed that I was there as well. They said, um, they said when they was first down in this cave, they said we're in there with thieves, rapists, murderers. Yeah, you know the the like the nastiest people that Jamaica has to offer, and we were we were like keeping ourselves to the back of this cave. <laughs> he said, and then um, one of them rolled a joint, and they start pa passing this joint around a circle. And he said, yeah. Then we sort of we moved into this circle of thieves and robbers. <laughs> thieves murderers and robbers basically basically to get a toke on the joint yeah um, when they got out the the guy uh the police chief took them to the cash point and basically like you've got to empty your cash point give us the money or else yeah. so they had no no choice to he said and then when they next saw him in town he said the guys there Hey guys, how you doing today? <laughs> They're like, yeah, just on it, man. They, they just fuck off, you mental head. You've just robbed. You just put us in prison and robbed us blind. Now, now you're pretending you are, mate. Well, anyway, they sold their they sold their airline ticket. They they went and cashed once they've been seen to buy them. They went and cashed it back in. Then they hid out. Then they hid out in their tent on the beach for another three weeks. Yeah. Before before they left on another boat. Um, yeah. Mad, mad place. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. You know, Bob Marley said there was a natural mystic in the air. And I tell you, there was a natural. It was unbelievable. The beauty of that place, you know, one day they took me up to the mountains and there uh, to the ganja fields, the marijuana fields. And we hiked for hours and we went up to the top and we were like, wow, unbelievable, beautiful. And it started to rain at the top of the mountain. We all ran down the mountain. We ran down the mountain and there was this little hut with his family with a mud floor. And we went in and they let a shelter in there and it was pouring the rain. I'll never forget it running down there. And again, we ran down again, down that mountain. And uh, this guy took us to this place where there was a cave, but inside the cave was roots of a tree. Bob Marley put it on his um, uprising. Um, I think it was uprising in the cover. And we sat there and we were wet. And I think we smoked a joint. Somewhere I wasn't eating too much to really, but I did. And um, wow, it was just one of the experiences, you know, that 
again, you put down to life really. And, and you know, that's what I did then. So moving on, um, what happened was I couldn't go to Jamaica because he did the incident with the 50 pound notes. So I was sending other people. Then someone very close to me came back and they were nearly dead. And I had to nurse them back. This person was so close to me. I'm not going to say it is. No way would I do that. But they all know who it is because they'll watch this now. And it, I went out onto my motorbike and I'll always remember I had a CBR 600 Super Sports. And when I went out to the motorbike, it had the, the mileage, but right at the bottom, that very day, we had only 666 miles. I'll never forget it. And I thought, wow, I never thought too much. You know, you don't as you're going through life. But then I've got this little boy who's been born. I've got the problem. I'm into the security. I'm going to see people again and doing all that nasty stuff. And then I think, do you know what? A shotgun could be put through my door at any time. And that little boy's in here. I said, it's time to go. We upped. I got myself a lot of money. And we flew over to the Red Demar and we moved. Me, Amanda, and a little boy. So we went over there. And instantaneously, I'm involved. Violence, drugs. I meet up with a murderer who's on the run, who's involved in organised crime. Doesn't it take us long before we're sending hash back to England and what is it? Where is it? I, mate? I'm not, I'm not, I, I know the name, I, I don't know geography, Lorette de Mar. Northern Spain, Lorette de Mar. Okay. Haven for the criminal fraternity. Yeah, got you. You got know, ya. haven for the runaway, haven for them that's um, ducking out, but full of them. Spain's like that. Fully dodgy people, huh? Fully a lot of nice people, but there is a criminal element that gets to Spain when they got to get out of the way for some for one reason or another. Um, lived in Spain a number of months, bang on the drugs by now, training's at the window and all that. Everything's at the window. And then I actually was on, I mean, I, I was I had a lot of it, a lot of ecstasy pills thousands of them that I took over to Spain. I was dealing in Spain and I got involved in a lot of violence in Spain as well. And I had like a lot of the Fionoid football hooligans. A couple of them I let move in with me. One of them ripped me off once and I let him off. He had like a tattoo of a dragon down his head. And one day I came in and I was drunk. You know, and I'll go into the details because you've asked me to do that. But again, I'm not proud of it at all. Um, he ripped me off and he stole my stuff. And uh, in front of my wife, I attacked him with an iron and burnt him. Kicked him down the stairs in his underpants. And the next again, two days later, this is how mad I was, really. It was me and my wife. You know, I said, I'm going to have to go to this club where all these people are. And I went myself to this club. And he was sitting there, his arms were all bandaged up in that, and all these football hooligans were in there. And I basically went to see them by myself and offered to take them on again. Now I was by myself. To this day, I, I scratched my head in bewilderment that they never just completely wasted me. But I just thought they must have thought I was so nuts and crazy that if they didn't kill me, they put the fear into them, you see. And what we're talking about is a tra very traumatised childhood Brian's been through, right? When you, when you suffer that battering, that extreme, you, you then enter a life of fear. While you're in fear mode, and so, so your natural biological me mechanism is in what we call fight or flight, so permanent adrenaline, yeah. permanent waiting to be smacked, waiting for that stepfather to come in and beat the shit out of you again right you're permanently in in this hyper alert state the thing is while you're in that state you remain in your left brain your right brain doesn't develop your empathy your love your kindness your understanding because that it all that stuff ain't necessary when you're just about to get whacked all you need is your primitive you might hear it called reptilian brain is you just need to be on high alert to defend yourself. 
And this is why you, this is the link why it, uh, violent, violent people, I don't want to say criminals, but let's just say violent criminals will, will go to these extreme measures that, that sound terrible and awful. But it's basically, if you track it, trace it back, it, it's the extreme trauma that they've had which is then hold, holding them them a prisoner. So I hope that makes sense. And the reason I'm saying this is I don't want Brian to feel um, in any way guilty by coming on my podcast. We, we need to say this what it is. Is it childhood tra- extreme childhood trauma manifesting as an adult because we haven't been allowed to traverse uh, to graduate to our right brain, the one of kindness, empathy that we naturally would have done had we not been fighting this fear our whole our whole life. Is that making sense, Brian? It was. It was. Yeah. It was based on fear. My whole life was based on fear, and I think that every major criminal that you get, who has to get so much more money, so much power to. And it goes for many walks in life. Criminality is another one that is worse because it does damage yourself and people. But, you know, it, the, the, the insecurity, really, insecurity, fear, you know, not just the stepdad beating you to a pulp, but getting bullied at school. You're maybe a little kid and you're continually getting bullied. Or you're in a house in a state and there's a gang that continually chase you down and beat the hide at you. Mm. You know, these are things that really... At some point, someone will either go one way and that's they'll fold and they'll kill themselves, or they'll snap and they'll go another way. And they will say, Do you know what? No more. No more. And then by saying no more, they embark in that lifestyle, going up and up and up, down the broad road even more, more and more, damaging themselves, damaging others. The whole thing is built on pride and ego. And one more thing. One more thing we need to acknowledge is we, it, crime is something that we can control. So when you've got a stepfather or whoever is like beating on you or a school teacher, that's out of your control. When you've got to be an adult, you want to control things because you don't want that to happen to you. And by embarking on a life of crime, you, you, in your brain, you're controlling your outcome because you can do act A and you will get, and it will result in C. So you rob a bank, you get a load of cash. You, to you, that you're, you're controlling it. This guy's hurting you, bang, in there, you smash him. You are, con- you are controlling it. Again, Brian, it's all products, isn't it, of this, this traumatised upbringing? There's a product, you can be a product to your environment, you know, um, you certainly can. You know, if you're in an area like a house in a state where people are getting stabbed to death and there's a culture in knife crime and, you know, there's gangs, it's difficult, huh? difficult for any child in that environment, difficult for any teenager in that environment. Very different down the south of England, may I add, very different. You know, you go up to Glasgow or Edinburgh, one of these house in estates, the and I'll tell you what, it's a fight for survival. It really is. It's a fight for survival. And it's hard for, for, for children or teenagers to have a normal life in that environment and turn out as a product that's going to be constructive to society. You know, it really is. You know, I think 85% of people in prison come from a one-parent family. Mm. The, st- the statistics say the lot, but the whole system's engineered to take out the two-parent family. We can see that. Yeah, of course. Part the, again, just part of the agenda, isn't it? Destroy the, the nuclear family, destroy the family unit, create division, create insecurity, create fear. Um, yeah, of course. It, it's it's the writing is on the wall when you when when you when you see it. So, at what point, mate? Did you did you have your? Can we call it an epiphany? When did you decide uh, to put let, this let, life let behind t- you? Let me tell you, I came back from, I left Spain, I went to the toilet and there was a load of blood. I said, we're leaving. I said, I've got to get my life together. We went, came back to a place called Eastbourne. 
I was in Eastbourne three weeks and I was there to start again in my new life. And one day I walked past the taxi, but three taxi drivers and they were beating one guy up very badly. I said, stop, man. I said, the guys, you know, you've got them now. And the guy punched me in the face. And then I ended up hitting him and I broke his eye. Massive guy, six feet, five, six, an unusual, weird height. Nobody mentioned his name and another two taxi drivers. They, they, there was evidence that they punched me first. And I thought, do you know what? I'm not pleading guilty to this because they offered to drop the charge to GBH to someone else. I said, he punched me. I'm not doing that. And I ended up going to the High Court and they found me guilty. And they said, you're a tough H Royal Marine. The boxing experience. He gave me four months. I was in Eastbourne three months or something like that. And when you think about all the violence I did, and I used to actually get a thrill and a kick that I got away with it all. And I got done with that. So I go in prison. And I'm just about to finish the sentence and the prison officer comes in. He says, Knox, you've got to go back to the judge. He thinks he's been too lenient with you. I went back to the judge and the judge said, Knox, I've been too lenient with you. I thought he was going to... I thought that he was going to give me a lesser sentence. Do you understand? But more, I thought he was giving me more. And he ended up giving me an 800 pound fine. I got out of prison. I got a job as a removal man for a little while. Then I met a guy from Bournemouth and he was into clothing. And I was hell bent on revenge for what had happened in Edinburgh. I was like, you know, I've got to, you know, I was set up to kill someone I knew and all that. And, I went to this guy to buy a gun, to buy a revolver, a, a, a weapon. And the guy said to me, he says, you know what? He said, there's something about you, son. The guy was for Bournemouth. He's still a good friend of mine now. 30 years later, actually, 25, 30 years later. Very good friend of mine. Loyal guy. And he says, you know what? Something about you. He said, you've been misguided in your life. He said, there's something about you. He says, I'm going to give you a chance. He said, I'm not going to give you a gun. I could give you one, but I'm not going to give you one. He says, I'm going to give you five grand of credit in these clothes, like certain clothes to sell, yeah? Fake clothes, designer clothes, some real, some not. And I started working with him. He says, you can run away with this. He says, that's up to you. I'm not bothered. Or he says, you can work with me and make a lot of money. Do you know something? I've done the right thing. I worked with him for years, five, six years, and I made good money. Probably a very good time in my life. I had another son born. I was behaving myself. I was not womanizing. I was working, doing the clothes. I used to get into the golf. Great lifestyle. I, I got a circuit of delivering clothes in Portsmouth, Plymouth, Bournemouth, North London, Eastbourne. So I just used to fill up a van, drop the boxes off twice a week and make three or four grand a week. I was loving it. Very peaceful, nice life. One of the best times in my life. But moving on, you know, he started, he would get tobacco, smuggled tobacco, cigarettes as well. Started selling that. And unfortunately, I got involved in, I thought, do you know what? I'm going to start going abroad. Got myself a little team together. And we started going to Kenya. We started going to Thailand. We started going to, um, to Tenerife all the time bringing cigarettes back, making a lot of money as well, buying them very cheap, bringing them back in the gangs, a couple of cases each for quite a while. Until, click clock, I get net, I get caught in um, Heathrow, got locked up. Can you believe it? Shocked. Well, I could believe it because I was stupid. You know, I was bringing six, case, six suitcases through customs of course I was going to get stopped, locked me up, put me in, gave me a prison sentence, wasn't a long time, but they put me in Belmarsh in the terrorist unit. It was terrible. Terrible. It, that, that four months in there was worse than any sentence I did. I used to laugh, but now I had a family. So what I did, I prayed. I said, you know what? Why, why you was know? it so bad, mate? Hey? Why was it so bad? 
I was in the I was in there and there was terrorists. It was just at the beginning of all this happening. Islamist terrorists, murderers, rapists. I was actually in there with a the guy who um, they said killed Jill Dando. He was in the same hall as me. I actually spoke to him. I think that was a setup. He never had a brain to do anything, really. I think he was a victim that was used. I think that woman was probably covering up some sexual abuse in the BBC. She was ready to expose it. I reckon she got taken out. Other people might think otherwise, but if you met this guy, he, he, he couldn't have done anything. You're lucky if you could have walked to the bus stop normally. Do you understand? Very tough place. Um, hard. Prison officers on you. It was a real prison. It was like, you know, they were on you. It was like they were in control. You weren't in control. They were in control. And they let you know it, you know. It's the kind of place you put your head down, you got on with it. Really, keep your mouth shut. My life had to change. I found myself in again, prayed, got out of jail. I did pray. I said, Do you know what, God? And we all do it sometime. I'm telling you what, if we're all over in a problem, bad, dark place, we will call that name of God. Whoever it is, or whoever we think it is, we'll say, God, get me out of here, or God, get me out of this room. I prayed. I said, Please give me a start with something new. I got out, I had a bit of money behind me. I got a job as a removal man for my brother-in-law. I was getting £65 a day. And he used to do contracting for big corporate companies in London, like Michael Gerson, certain things like that. Up, up market, big companies. Very proper packing. It was all like banks and this and that. It was like a normal removal company. Do you understand? It was a VIP export packing. And I got into it with him, and then his partner tried to rip him off. I sorted his partner out. I became a partner within about a month. Six weeks, two months, or a month. So I started going straight, got into the removal industry, learned how to do that. For the first time in my life, I was legitimate. Believe it or not, Brian was legitimate. I was walking, I was believing, I was being good. I started going to church and all that. I was living the life. And I uh, really was pretty successful over a 15, 14, 15 year period where I ended up with a number of companies, one of them called Global Moving Systems, where I ended up a director and making, at the better, I got a good week, 20,000 pounds. Average week, seven, eight, five. And it went from strength to strength. Can you just hold on one second, please? Yeah. I have something I want to show you. This is the old portfolio to the company. Yeah? Yeah. And it was like a high VIP level move in. You see that? Yeah, I got you. So that was it, you know, exemplary. It was all international. And I'd done like company profile pictures of the men. Do you see me there at the bottom? Yeah, I got you. And it was like, it was a big company. I built, you know, I put everything into it over those years. And I ended up like building a company that was had its own other directors, me as the main one, other directors, operations manager, sales department. It was big, you know. And um, unfortunately, the devil makes work for idle hands. The Albanians moved into the country and then I employed a few of them. And, you know, thinking back about it, I had too much money, too much time in my hands. As soon as I had everybody in their place, I fell away. I fell away from what I believed in. And that was walking in the light. Yeah, as you said, walking in the light. I started to walk in the darkness again. One guy took me to a brothel when I ended up seeing the hooker. Moved in with her. Got her a flat box, her off in Brighton. And I was living the nasty lifestyle off behind the wife's back, doing what I was doing. Um, and it went down that road, making far too much money. I had the only 
fully the ego. I was fully the ego. You know, this and that. I was this and that. I've done it all myself. It was total rubbish. I'd done it with the people who were around me. That's how it got successful. It was them women that made it successful. But, you know, I was so egotistical at the time and thought it was brilliant that that's what happened. Fell away. Ended up addicted to cocaine. Started to travel and go to following ACDC around the world, seeing the concert, sending £30,000 on a weekend at tickets, no exaggeration, no exaggeration. Two nights, giving tickets away at the door that cost four or five grand, just for the reaction on people's faces. It was in New York, and there was many other places around the world that unfortunately followed that band. Started getting into the new age, David Icke, his boots, shamanism, yoga, taking the drugs, thinking I'm Jack the Lad, you know, thinking I was brilliant, really. Bought houses. Deterioration through the time with drugs, on the cocaine, on the drinking, still training, shooting growth hormone, something that a lot of people do in Hollywood. Keeps, makes me, they call it the fountain of youth, and a lot of them are on it. Makes you feel like God, you know, keep me to keep you young in that. Um, got tattoos all over my body. Spent money on a Harley Davidson, but I was running around as a real rebel with this. And I had this big company there and that. And I was just about to come down to life with a bump, really. Because I, I bought, I was on this growth form and I don't know if it tampered with my hormones or whatever it was. I was never a homosexual in my life. Never. I would have vomited. Drugs combination. I met like a effeminate male in a bar. Ended up having a relationship with him. Never done that in my life. Never done that after I got the tattoos. Ended up getting a spa, built a spa called Mahayana with him, one business of the year. And um, I was about to have a major fall. Obviously, I left the wife because of what was going on. I couldn't have been me off during that. I don't know if it was the hormones. I was, this stuff's making me last you six weeks. I'm shooting like two weeks worth into my book. Two months worth into my body in about two weeks. So I'm on that, the coke, I'm training, I'm getting pissed, and I'm training hard as well, doing the MMA and all that. Turn it, talk about burning the candle at both ends. Head gone, really. So I'll Sam? get the spa. Oh, pardon? Sounds like Rise of the Foot Soldier. Whatever you want to call it. Rise of the biggest mistakes you do in your life, soldier, more like. I had everything, you know, and uh, I flushed it down the, you know why? I flushed it down the toilet because I love to walk in the dark. I've been doing it all my life. It gave me a thrill to take that risk more than anybody else. Do you know what? It was not the way forward. My family suffered now in a way you didn't know. I lost a multi-million pound company. I deserved it. The spa went out the window. I ended up selling it. I spent nearly a quarter of a million pound on that place. And I'll tell you where I ended up. I ended up with an evangelist meeting me in, uh, his name's John Lawson. He's wrote a book. It's called Was Once a Wicked Man. And he met me in that, in, a, in that the place where that company, that, that shop won Business of the Year. It was called Mahayana. Strangely enough, I got the Mahayana tattoo. Tattooed on my skin before I got the shop. I never knew I was getting it. And it was in a shop called Demon Bar, Demon Tattoo Shop. Wake up. So can this you happened. It's can, you, can you explain the, 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 why is that symbolism relevant? What, the, what, what's Maria? Well, I was into the new age. I was doing the yoga, the drugs, you know, this free living, liberalism and all that. And I ended up getting this tattoo, which was a Buddha tattoo. It was a, Mahayana Buddha, it's crossed out now with the Mahayana sign. And you see here, this was eyes. Whatever possessed me, that was swastikas as a Buddhist peace sign. There was so much in the Buddhism. You'll see here, there's eyes on the back of the tattoos. You see the eye in there? Okay, yeah. And on my back, my back's covered. It's all in the documentary. And I'll tell you something, that business one, business of the year, and it was all new age practices. It was all um, tarot cards, clear cuts, 
tarot cards, health things. I didn't realise how far gone I'd went. It was like I thought I was normal and everybody else was crazy. Anyway, cut a long story short. I'm going to tell you something. And we'll end it with this. Should you want to know more, we can talk on. I've got some interesting things I would like to bring up with you, actually. But I ended up in a Christian ministry, in a Christian ministry named the Ministries that deals with the demonic. The ministry is about people with the demonic in them. And things happened in that place during a nine to 12 month period that changed my life. And I've seen things in there, believe me, believe you me, that changed my life and the life of the other people so much. And I'll tell you something, it's been five years ago now. No, got the money I used to have. No, got the pride I used to have. No, got the heart I used to have. My brain's been transformed for the first time in my life, five years later, to being a normal, decent member of society. That's what's happened. And for you to want to know what, how it happened, you know, I'll give Chris my documentary and you can make up your own mind yourself. So much things going on in the world right now. It's an unusual time. Chris knows it's an unusual time. You know, he's alerting people as much as he can on his podcasts. You know, like me, he's been around the block a lot. Probably a lot of people on Chris's channel have been around the block a lot. I believe you're a lot of ex-horses probably, as well as many other things. Is that right, Chris? Sorry, mate, we just got invaded by a, Hue a Huey helicopter. I think it's... <laughs> I think I upset Oliver Stone the other day. Um, yes, mate, it, it's fascinating. Um, it's it's perfectly fine. Brian, can we just have an honest conversation now? Yeah. Because you you're a big guy, I'm a big guy. We've both been around the block. We're not absolutely you know, let's we're, do it. We're, the, the, the reason I don't go down like the God, the Jesus, the cross. I can the, understand the, that. Totally. Even though I, I understand it all, I understand it on a physical perspective, a metaphysical, yeah. a spiritual, a kundalini. But I, like, I get the story of Jesus, right? Yeah. But it's a few things. It's, it's that I don't want my life to be talking in a language that's divisive. Yeah. Right. I don't join gangs. We don't need to. We don't need to be members of gangs or clubs or, or societies to feel good about ourselves. Right. Yeah. And if we adopt the language of these, then it's 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 not the nirvana. We're not creating. I don't believe the nirvana that we were put on earth to live in. Yeah. So. Uh, and so. I don't say God, I say universe, because that's to me what people mean when they say God. They talk yeah. about that beautiful, powerful spirit, source, what, 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 however we want to call it, that you cannot deny is there because yeah. like we live in a universe. It might be a simulation. It might be a, a box of cornflakes. We, we're probably never going to know. Who cares? But there is, a, there is this thing that we're all involved in, right? Seems to be made up of carbon molecules. If you want to go smaller than those molecules, then we're talking quantum quantum physics. Amen. Right? And it, and it, 100%. It, you know, it all gets really, really clever. But here's the thing. Yeah. I believe in, in a purity of understanding. Yeah. That shies away from using divisive terminology because once yeah. we do, once we do that, we're buying into the agenda of the sociopaths. I they, yeah. I understand where you're coming from, okay? Mm. But the thing with you and me and everybody else, we're all entitled to our worldview, yeah? You know, I look at this creation and it is. The design of it and, and what it is that we see in front of us is just too advanced that there is not what I would believe a creator. You'd call it the universe. But I would have my belief in what it is, from what I read. You know, you look at every seed's different, every plant's different, you know. Um, and as you've seen, Chris, it was very interesting. The way we got in contact was one way that you, your podcast, dropped through into my, into my iPad, 
yeah? It dropped into my iPad and you were discussing that um, X Factor winner, um, Etila Childers, exposing the world's secret religion. That's yeah. how you dropped into my um, view, you know? Yeah, I mean, we can talk about that. You know, Freemasonry is just another system like all the others that, 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 that they control. That's why the guy's allowed to put a five hour video on YouTube about it is it's irrelevant to the to the real masters of this. Well, I say masters, I should say controllers, because um, it's just another thing that's going to divide people. It's um, this is what is referred to as the spiritual battle. It's an invisible battle that takes place in here. And it and what what takes place in there then manifest throughout the whole universe. Do you know something? Do you know, do you know the way I do this? Mm. I do not confirm to this world, but I am regenerated by the renewing of my mind. That's how I do it moving forward. It's what for me. I'm regenerated by the renewing of my mind daily, away from who I was to who I'm becoming more and more. And it's daily getting better. So that's good. And um, yeah, so very interesting, you know. It's, it's literally about how we are as we sit here now, because that's all really what we've got, isn't it? It's in in the moment. All the stuff that we've done in the past. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, if 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 certain people are going to benefit from my mistakes to realise, and it's going to stop people going a certain way, that it's going to be very unhealthy for their life. I'm happy with that. I'll put myself out on the line. I'll put myself up front to say, you know what? This isn't the way to go. There is a satanic element to the world. For me, I chose what I believed in. I'm not, you know, I can't, I'm not in any way trying to force anybody by putting anything on them. That's everybody's own choice. That can only happen by their own free will. And that's what we got. We got our free will, you know. Um, we just have to look outside. The world's changing quickly and it's changing. People think it's going to get better. Do you know what? I've got bad news. I don't think it is. I think it's going to get worse. I think there's certain things coming this way, our way, that we have no idea about. And um, be good to get, there's a lot of people prepping, eh? prepping and getting ready and uh, I don't know when stop it, whatever it is, but there is such changes to the world and the world system that, that you know, I can't go on about what it is or what's going on, but we all can see that with our own eyes. And, uh, wow, it is, certain things are coming out in the, coming out in the mainstream media that's quite mind-blowing. And, and what was more mind-blowing than that is stuff that is coming out there about Hollywood and sex cults and satanic cults. I've got something that you can cut out of this, Chris, but I really fe feel led to do it. It's from a written from a guy who knows a friend of mine that's in prison, and he, he was he was a barrister, he was a special forces soldier, and he, he he was for the last twenty seven years he's been exposing satanic ritual abuse on a public level around the world, and they got arrested. And I just want to read this. It said, Dear Brian, I'm writing to you on behalf of a brother in Christ and friend. We're standing with him in the work he has been involved in over the past 27 years, namely to expose the horror and evil of sexual abuse of all kinds, including SRA, satanic ritual abuse. Please do all you can to prevent a serious miscarriage of justice and to protect a very vulnerable child and so many others there today. I look forward to hearing from you. That's the kind of thing we're up against. It's going on all around the country, children's homes. It's going on for decades. Abusive children, sexual exploitation. And, you know, we're up against it, aren't we? The other, so much is getting exposed now that never used to. You know, if we cannot love the children and protect children, what kind of society are we anyway? If we just want to... Some things are that horrible, we didn't really want to hear it, really. 
we shut our ears off, don't we, to the horror of you know, what we're hearing. The issue is, Brian, I'm sorry, I'm just saying it as I see it, but yeah, as much as these individual cases, of which I have no doubt there's uh, millions worldwide, yeah. right? Yeah. As much as they're horrific and that they tear at our heartstrings and that no nobody should suffer, let alone, let alone a, a, a child, they become a window through which people project their own feelings of whatever in life. Uh, might be inadequacy, might be anger, might be fear, might be self-loathing might be just just general pissed offness at the state of, of course of you know that, that that's that's what ha it's meant to produce isn't it and unless we're willing to look deeper than that to look at source to look at the fundamentals then yes as much as this young person needs saving that's beyond any you know no one's going to argue that it's it's why does this keep happening why have we clearly got a whole um, strata in society of, of, of people who are living in darkness and committing such, um, such uh, you know, such dark acts? Yeah. And of course, when we trace it back, we'll find that they went through this satanic abuse as, as youngsters themselves, and they're just con continuing this, this, this cycle. Yeah. And I'm not like offering an answer here, but what I'm saying is I'm sure it comes down to, we have to win the battle within ourselves first. We have to enter that, that state of pure, um, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling for the words because I'm not, probably not that for an author I'm probably not that good at words anyway but you know we, we, we have to work on ourselves first and if we don't these mechanisms are used by people that are way cleverer than us to just keep controlling us all you, know, you look at yeah. you look at man and what man's capable in his heart. You just have to look at Auschwitz, don't you? That's what man is capable of. Human man is capable of something like that. So you know, the, the us as beings, you know, we're capable of the most horrendous things. You know, how did something like that in that country happen? You see, well, what that, caused it? It, 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 it? If we truly understood the events in this world, Brian, I can tell you now, they go way darker than you, the we can, than the most people can comprehend. Way. W I, I absolutely agree with you. And I believe that everything in this planet, you know, no matter what way you want to see it, your Kundalini way or my way, everything in this human life is guided by some spiritual force or another. That's what I do believe. It's, fasc it's all fascinating, mate. It's all fascinating. I think it's good we have these conversations. Yeah. I, I will keep saying, though, friends, you need to bring it back to love. Love, love that's lo it. Love lo is, but pure love, pure love can be corrective as well. It's not always going to be that. It's going to be corrective love. The way that if that a father would, with love, always love his son, but he'd correct him. If he loved them, there'd be some form of discipline to make him a good, young, positive man, wouldn't there? But, you know, we have to get that, that discipline right and with love. Do you know yeah, what I'm saying? We, it begins with ourselves, doesn't it? If we can't, we need to love ourselves and we have to learn to accept ourselves. And if you can accept yourself, as again, as just part of this you know not 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 this separate individual identity that the sociopaths have created 
by giving you birth certificate and giving you a Mercedes in the drive and a silly watch and then making you think, hey, look, if I pierce my I've nose... Made it. I've got, I've got the, the, the house, the Rolex. Yeah, yeah, all of that it's is... Like not... you have a company, you mean? All of yeah. that is, is, is magic. I think you spell that magic with a K. It's to make you believe you're an individual and that you go out in this world and you did it. And why? Because that keeps you in your left brain. It, it keeps you in your ego self until you can understand you're not that individual, your universe, um, your universe. And when you understand your universe, and so Brian is me, I'm Brian. We're the same thing. It's just universe experiencing itself in two separate separate forms. It's very clever. It, 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 I think some of the teachings in the Kabbalah or some of the understands the Kabbalah go, go back to this kind of thing. But when you understand that, then you understand the 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 nonsense of one individual hurting another one because we're the same, right? It's like two rocks on the beach going, hello, mate. What's your name? I'm called Kev. All right, Kev. What car do you drive? Well, I, I, I drive a, a, a Porsche. It makes me like a bit of a better rock than, than you, if you don't mind me saying. Oh, well, actually, I've got a bloody Mercedes in the garage, right? Um, Kev, how do you do, how do you like, style your hair or what it is our favor a skinhead because that makes me that right the utter ludicrousness that two rocks would even have that conversation is the ludicrousness of the human condition what we're all experiencing now we're all looking for some kind of identity in some way or another and throughout this world we can put on different identities that aren't quite too healthy for us that's what it is and I think the, the, the thing over the last four or five years, I've put on something that's changed my life and it's just made me see me in a different way in the way it's had a positive effect on my behaviour, but please believe me, not without failure. There's no rules to it. There's no rules. There's no, I have to do this or go to church on Sunday. It's not even, I don't have to go to church if I don't want to. It's up to me. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time I don't. But um, it's just our individuality, what we would consider through what we bring in our, our own minds, what we think is right and morally acceptable. I'm not the person that I was four or five years ago. Thank God for that. Um, and I just hope that some goodness comes from our meeting today, you know, Chris and... Uh, it's really good to meet you, actually. It's really good to meet you. You too, brother. You too. It's been um, it's been enlightening for me. See, Brian, I talk about a lot of serious stuff. You know, yeah. I, I at nineteen years old, I I marched down the centre of a, a of a major city in the so called the so called you know sophisticated world with yeah. a machine with a machine gun, right? it's you know one of the guys I went over there with didn't come back yes I understand it, 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 it gets serious it, 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 and so but I don't in any way want to be spreading fear for people yes I, I love the rich tapestry of life I, I, I like to I like to go go deep <laughs> sounds like a comedy or something I'm yeah. going deep Deep. I'm going deep. Deep, deep huh. <laughs> you know, I like that, but I would stop doing it if I thought I was t if I was instilling fear in people. I I want people to come in, you know, just I want people to step into their right brain. If you want not, you want people you know. to have some hope where I, there's not a lot of hope out there. There's fear. I don't there's even want them to have hope, Brian. Really. Yeah. I want them to realize that we're already there. We're already in, you know, it, it, Nirvana is, it's all around us. We, we just need to wake up to it. Um, and it's not until we can get ourselves into this to get ourselves in equilibrium that we can then address what's happening to others because it, it starts at, it starts at home. I'm sure every scripture in the Bible or whatever, if you 
if you go deep, it probably talks about building foundations and, and, and this sort of stuff. Yeah, building foundations. And it says basically God is love, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And we, if we, if we, do, if we say to ourselves that we have no sin, we're liars and we're calling him a liar. So we all sin, we all sin every day. Our life's like that. You know, we're human beings. We move in through our life. And that's it, you know, we, it's a very, as I said, it's a very unusual time in the world history right now. We just have to look at the window to know it. And um, we're all going to see what the truth is at the end, aren't we? Hey, I'm going to finish on your mate, if you've been in Jamaica, Bob Marley, isn't it? Every little thing is going to be all right. There you go. Hallelujah. Don't worry <laughs> about a thing. That's yes. it. I actually spoke about things here that I've never done on any podcast ever. And I've done a few. You can see them on certain channels. Um, you know, if anybody wants to contact me, um, you know, they can get in touch with me at brian.resurrectionlifeministries. Um, I, I'll, I'll email the, 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 my, my contact details to Chris if anybody feels that they're damaged or anything like that or decides to look another way and what, what I do that they want help um, and that they're mentally damaged or, you know, if, if they, if just whatever, really, I'm there for them. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to have met you. I hope to, I hope to, I hope to meet you in the future sometime. If I'm over there, I'm going to get in touch with you and I'm going to take you for a bit of lunch or a cup of coffee. How does that sound? I was going to say, you don't want to borrow money off me, do you? Absolutely not. <laughs> do you want to borrow? Do you, do you, want, to borrow, do you want any of off me? <laughs> Actually, yeah. Can you lend us a tanner? I can. I'll say, I, ta- I can. I'm can saving email up. Me your, email me your details and I'll have it to you within 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. No, I'm going to put, I'll put your details below the, below the video. It's been great, brother. Thank you very much. Much love to you. Thanks, um, Chris. I, I don't think you've made mistakes in the past, mate. I think you, you, you had an extreme challenges put at you at a young age. This yeah. manifested in, in as you were trying to become a, 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 an adult. You explored some avenues that weren't particularly helpful. And then one day, you, you, you um, can we say the universe or God or whatever gave you that ability to suddenly... Exactly. I, I, found, what the, I found the light for me. Yeah. You stopped and you God. self-reflected and you thought, hang on a sec. This ain't just about me, is it? This ain't just about me. And... And all good credit to you, mate. You know, you 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 know, you you keep doing keep doing what you're doing. And to everyone at home, keep doing what you're doing. And remember, Bob Marley. Much love to you all. If you could please like and subscribe, then we can have another mad rambling conversation that I hope you can just get a little bit from. Might be good, might be bad. I don't know, but but at least at least we're talking. See you later. God bless you, man. You too, mate.